Very good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, so when I first landed in the US, it was in a city called Chicago. And the first thing I did, took a cab and went to U Chicago. Spent a day there and realized why, why the whole world, the teenagers and the graduate students are crazy to go to that country to study. I saw these amazing faculty who were there to help students. Some of them who had won their Nobel uh, awards all over the world. The research opportunities were fantastic. The campus in itself was a city that offered literally everything that I wanted, not just for my education, but also to have an amazing social life. And then took a flight to Boston. I would say one of my favorite cities. And that's why I chose that picture that we see well, mighty Harvard, but other than that, it also has those two amazing universities uh, where we have our two guest speakers today uh, uh, from Boston University and Northeastern. Uh, so Rohan Bajaj, thank you so much for joining us, uh, uh, from, uh, tuning in from Boston early morning. Rohan, thank you. Thank you so much, Warren, to be here. And it's really a pleasure to be speaking and share some tips which can hopefully help people for this year and beyond. So I'm going to tell you a bit about Rohin Bajaj. I got a chance to work this boy with this boy for over, you know, I would say 18 months or so. And he was really into going to the US universities for several reasons. I mean, although he wants to become a doctor and I did tell him, hey, why don't you go to the UK and start your medicine immediately and finish it off? He was like, no, I know why I want to go to the US and why I want to go to a particular university. His sister was already in the US and he was like, why don't I need to get into a university with excellent scholarship? I'm so happy uh, to introduce him today that he's the trustee scholar at the Boston University, which actually offers you free tuition. Absolutely 100% scholarship. Rohin, congratulations. It was not only Boston University, but also many other top universities in the US that actually offered him 100% scholarship or even the financial aid. So well done. And I'd like you to share your entire journey. How did you make it happen? Uh, and you know, uh, inspire some of our uh, audiences today. Thank you. Oh. Great, so Adhiraj. The second boy, Adhiraj, thank you so much. I know you're camping and uh, you took out some time. Uh, Adhiraj is going to be a freshman candidate at Northeastern University this year. He completed his IB diploma, had the most difficult two years of his life, lost somebody who was very, very close to him, but he made sure he didn't lose his focus. He ended up writing excellent essays and is going to his dream university, that is Northeastern. And I know it was a great decision uh, because it was your early decision choice. So congratulations, Adhiraj, uh, for getting into the school that you really wanted to go to. Thank you, Varun. And once again, good evening to everyone that's tuned in today. All right, guys. So in today's session, uh, my agenda is to talk to these two brilliant students uh, who actually made it to the colleges that they wanted to go to. It's not just about going to a top university that's ranked by some other ranking website. It's not just about going to an Ivy League. It's about finding the right fit. It's about finding the college that suits you. It's about finding the college that offers the program that you wanna study. It's about finding that institution which would offer you the foundation for your future social life, not just your academic achievements. It's about finding a place that actually complements your interests, your hobbies, your extracurricular activities, and at the same time, possibly offers you some financial aid or scholarship that you want. So in today's session, we're gonna find out how these two awesome high schoolers went to the universities that they wanted to go to and how they managed to find that right fit. So Rohan and Adhiraj, once again, thank you so much for joining us. Guys, my name is Varun Jain and I represent Brighter Prep. And let's begin our journey with these two panelists. All right, so Rohan, I'll go to you first as you've just completed your freshman year at Boston University. And I'm gonna keep emphasizing 100% scholarship. Trustee scholar, 
I guess you guys live separately from the rest of the students at the university. Right. So uh, for the trustee scholars, firstly, I'm very thankful and very glad that I got the option to be a scholar. And all thanks to you, Varun, and the entire Bride of team. I know how much I pestered you during the application season, but hopefully it was all worth it. Uh, so the trustee scholars here in the university, uh, BU selects around 20 each year. And yes, we do get an accommodation, which is separate from the rest of the uh, students. But we also have a choice to live in normal college housing, student housing, where uh, which is like filled with uh, freshmen and sophomore students. Along with housing, um, we are guaranteed one semester of funded research with a professor of our choice. So if you submit an application to the College of Engineering, for me, for example, they will approve the funding and they will say, okay, you can get go with the professor from XYZ date. Along with that, um, we have a trustee reception once every semester. So you can invite a professor or anyone of your choice and you can connect with the trustee scholars in the, in the college. You can connect with different professors and they always invite one special guest who will be the keynote speaker for the day. And along with that, uh, we have planned events throughout the semester, like going to the Boston Orchestra or like going uh, for a movie or like a talk by a different professor in a different college. So overall, it's a great opportunity to be with like-minded right. individuals and, again, very grateful. Amazing. So Rohan, this all happened after you went through what you went through during your high school. So all the candidates that, uh, that are watching this webinar today, uh, let me take you back to where they are. You know? So let's say after 10th grade, tell us more about your situation when you got to know about all these things that you see on the screen. I mean, which university, how do I build my profile, different types of tests. So tell me your state of mind so that, you know, everyone can relate to what were you going through, how important it was for you and your family, and how actually you managed to, uh, you know, get through uh, this journey. All right. So firstly, uh, I know that the pandemic affected everyone's lives and those who were applying this year and this upcoming year, I know that your situation has been much more difficult than me. And so I, so whatever I'll be saying would be like pre-pandemic. After 10th grade, after I finished my CBAC 10th board exams, I had an idea, I had like the confidence that I really want to go to the US just because of the opportunities they present and the interdisciplinary learning. And so like throughout 11th grade, which was the pre-pandemic year, um, I really tried my best to put myself out there in different school events. Um, I joined the student government of my school. And along with that, I was in contact with different uh, cultural clubs outside of my school, like the Indian club in Abu Dhabi, and just like the environmental club of the UAE. And through the cooperation and like volunteering in different organizations, I really tried to build my profile uh, in multiple aspects. I do know, and I'm aware that this process is a long one as they ask for your grades and like your activities since grade nine but it's never too late to start. And so if you have a proper strategy, like maybe even from grade 11 onwards or like the middle of grade 11 and everything which is mentioned on the screen, I'm sure that um, you can build a great profile and you will actually find the college which you go to. You won't be lucky to go to the college, but the college will be lucky to have you just because everyone's talented and everyone has their own unique aspects. You see the very, very good, uh, you know, line that you just mentioned is that college would be lucky to have you. And guys, a college will be lucky when you actually find the right fit for yourself. Then you don't have to sell yourself. You just have to share who you are as a person and what you have done. So Adhiraj, um, IB diploma, it's difficult. And then everything else that happened with you and the pandemic going on, how did you prepare yourself and how did you make sure that, uh, you know, you got into the university that you wanted to go to? And I'd also like to, you know, emphasize a little bit on how did you choose that college uh, going yeah. forward? Adhiraj. So, Varun, just like the slideshow that's up right now and the sort of roadmap, the first step is definitely identifying, you know, which university is the one you want to go to or apply to. And to be honest, at the end of 10th is really when you start thinking about it or making that decision. And for me, uh, at the end of 10th is really when the pandemic began. So, you know, you're, you're reading all these things, you're hearing things, you know, unnatural acceptance rates, 
colleges, you know, not taking students. So I think for me, I really try to filter out a lot of the inf information that might be demotivating and want to just focus on, you know, universities and programs that maybe I've heard of, but also some programs that I was referred to. So I'm pretty fortunate to be in a school where there's a very good relationship with some of the counselors, the students, the teachers, and the seniors. So I, that's how I got referred to the university that I'm ending, uh, ending up at. So with Northeastern, my first interaction really was a, a referral that someone gave me to the uh, region rep uh, for Northeastern. So I got in touch with them. I met them at a uh, culture, uh, at a college fair, sorry, when they came to my school as well. Uh, and that's really when I started taking a lot of interest in this university. And so I think at the end of 10th, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot going on. There's a lot to think about. Of course, you have that impeding, uh, impeding pressure of the diploma program, as you said. But for me, the more I started learning more about Northeastern, the sort of intramural activities, and just like how Rohan said, uh, for me, I like to be there. I like to be part of events, you know, if not leading them, definitely, you know, being an, an active participant. So I think with Northeastern, it, everything just clicked, really. It, it was a school that's, as I think, Varun, you could probably talk about this, but it's a school that's sort of up and coming. Uh, you know, Northeastern, seven years back, is not necessarily the Northeastern that we all know today uh, in terms of, you know, innovation and programs. So I think for me, uh, the minute I saw the program, not necessarily the rankings, I think oftentimes we get lost in numbers, but it was the program, the school, and I think also word of mouth that played a huge role in choosing Northeastern. Brilliant, brilliant. So uh, uh, guys, let's begin the pathway to your dream American university. First of all, let's come up with an Excel sheet. What do you wanna study? Identify the program. That's very, very important. Uh, you know, you've got different kinds of fields, uh, you know, so medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, or, you're looking at something more related to engineering, computer sciences, data science, or you want to study law, you want to study something related to business or economics, you want to study international relations or psychology, or you're a creative person who want to get into you know, art and design and drama and whatnot. Once you identify the program, then I think you should actually start looking at the university. And then you should start looking at the country. That's what I personally feel. I think it's a funnel where actually you start broadly what you like. It's not just about, I'm good at sciences and that's why I should study medicine or engineering. No, what you're passionate about. Have you done a few internships? Have you interviewed people who are actually in the profession that you might want to pursue? I have seen a lot of students who haven't done well in biology ended up becoming doctor and then they work towards improving themselves. And I know a candidate who actually took math, physics, uh, business and drama in A-levels and ended up actually studying drama, although she was brilliant in math and physics, that didn't motivate her to go and study engineering. She actually pursued what she was actually interested in. So I'm gonna go back to Rohin and I remember, um, and, and I hope uh, that still continues. Rohin, you wanna study medicine but you're not in the UK, which is what actually most of the uh, you know, kids uh, go, especially from the UAE. And they join the five years MBBS program right after high school in the UK and complete their medicine and then get into you know, the specialization. Why did you choose to go to the US and how did you decide the program that uh, you're studying currently? Right, uh, so for the UK, like if you wanna pursue medicine, uh, the best path is to go to UK because of direct uh, acceptance and direct admissions. But for me, even though I was like, sure, I want you to do medicine, I was open to exploring other fields. And that's where I love the idea of interdisciplinary learning in the US. So in the US, like you have a buffer period of four years, like you enter college at 18 or 19, and you pursue an undergrad degree in literally anything you want. Uh, if you want to do engineering, you can do that. If you want to explore business, you can do that. And so in these four years, you can actually have an idea of what you actually want to learn and what you want to pursue. Because at the end of the day, whatever you pursue, you'll do it for the rest of your life. And that's a long time. So I was open to other fields. But I'm happy to say that over the past one year, as I finished my freshman year, I've become even more convinced of medicine just because of the experiences I've had and the programs that Boston University has offered to me. The major which I'm doing is biomedical engineering. 
And the reason for that is along with being connected to the healthcare field, which is my goal, but I can also pursue my engineering passion, such as building 3D organs or like doing research on tissues and cells of the body. So when I was exploring my major options in uh, high school, like in 12th grade, along with Varun, I told him that biomedical engineering, if medicine doesn't happen, BME is something which I feel I can actually pursue. It interests me, it excites me, and uh, doing research uh, over the past one year, I can say that it does excite me. And so, yeah, uh, I'm really grateful that I've got experiences which have convinced me of both engineering and medicine. And now the next goal is to apply for medical schools here in the US in the next two to three years. Well, fantastic. Congratulations. It's going to be a challenging journey. And I know you will overcome those challenges. Adiraj, IB Diploma, how did you choose your subjects? Did you already know what you wanted to study uh, during undergrad? Uh, your decision was, was it based on the subjects that you were good in? Or was it based on the career goals that actually you had in mind? Um, yeah. That is on that. So Varun, I, I think it's it's a mix of both, really. So one of them being subjects, I've always had a passion for economics and business. So uh, I knew that I would see myself in the future doing something related to those fields, but I wasn't really sure, you know, what that would look like. And I think the second part, which motivated me to study finance at Northeastern is um, I, I look up to my dad in a, lo in a lot of ways. So him being in finance, uh, sort of seeing his career and, you know, what's left of it and what's going to happen in the future and everything. I think that motivated me a lot. Uh, and also knowing that, you know, he could sort of be a mentor for me. And the third thing, which was very important, and I think Rohan touched upon this as well, is the U.S. offers this flexibility that I think not many countries can offer or their curriculums. And, you know, uh, sort of having that flexibility and knowing that, you know, what I've chosen is not the end all and be all and that there are other options. I think that's very reassuring, uh, not just to me, but also to my family so that, you know, if I ever have a mood change or if I ever want to do something else, uh, you know, I can always uh, pursue that. And so for Northeastern, I think uh, they have a very good co-op program. It's been ranked number one consecutively for the past couple of years. And additionally, uh, with finance at Northeastern, they have this uh, program option, which they offer, where essentially you can combine majors and you really can make your own major. So when I went for one of the Northeastern introduction meetings, I heard that there are more than 400 majors that students have made in the last two years in the business school. So combining their interest for, let's say, finance or entrepreneurship with something as niche as, let's say, philosophy or Greek studies or something as like real estate. So I think that combination and that flexibility is really what appealed to me. One of the questions that came to me today, and you know, it comes to me, uh, you know, quite often, uh, something related to being scared of choosing certain kind of majors. Parents come to me and tell me, Varun, my child is going to study uh, liberal arts. He or she is not pursuing STEM degree. Will my child get some jobs? I was talking to a mother this afternoon and uh, she, after spending over a year uh, on you know, preparing the profile to apply for colleges that offer psychology, she was like, are we taking the right decision? What would you recommend as a student? How can these kids and even parents and families get over this fear of employability uh, you know, that exists? And it's uncertain, you know, it, it's uncertain for any industry. And, and my answer to them, of course, was to follow their passion and study because in each field, there are excellent jobs. So Rohan, like if someone wants to study something which is not computer science and something which is not mechanical engineering, and it is psychology or international relations. I mean, you have so many colleagues at BU, you were telling me, who are actually pursuing those majors. How should we, who are sitting here outside the US, get over that fear? Yeah, so uh, I was telling Warren earlier that along with having friends who are in engineering or like in STEM majors, some of my very close friends are pursuing liberal art degrees. Uh, they're pursuing psychology, neuroscience, theater for that matter. And all I wanna say is, as long as someone pursues their passion and someone who does what excites them, they'll flourish. Like my friends pursuing psychology, neuroscience, they're flourishing in terms of getting internships. They're getting opportunities with research professors and they're really enjoying the major. 
whenever I ask them about how their subjects are going, like how academics exams are going, they say it with a smile that I'm doing well and really enjoying what I'm doing. So yeah, yeah. obviously there'll be people who are meant for engineering, who are meant for business, and they'll realize that. There'll also be people who know that liberal art majors are, is what's meant for them. Uh, and all I want to say is like the US is excellent in terms of STEM and non-STEM. There's no discrepancy between any of the fields. If you want to pursue psychology, if you're good at it, the US and the college will make sure that they'll give you everything, every opportunity for you to flourish and have the best experience over here, the best undergrad and moving on to the best grad and best master's programs. And just to add to what Rohan said, you don't need to really know. And if you don't know, then also US is actually a good place to study. It gives you the opportunity to explore. So guys, there are a lot of top universities in America that actually you can consider and a lot of good universities that you can consider. You don't necessarily have to go to Harvard, Stanford or Berkeley. You can actually go to other good universities like Boston University and Northeastern and UIUC and Georgia Tech and UNC Chapel Hill and University of Virginia or Maryland. Or you could also look at the bunch of liberal arts and science colleges, which are fantastic from Amherst, Williams to Claremont McKenna, Pomona, Vassar, Middlebury, Wellesley. These are great schools. The funnel begins from what do you want to study? What skill sets you have? What passion you have? Identify the major and then let's start focusing on finding the right universities come up with an Excel sheet, put down those universities there, present a business plan, an academic business plan to your parents and understand from them if they are willing to support you, if the resources that are available within the family are sufficient to allow you to go and study in the US. Even if they are not, there are enough scholarship opportunities and financial aid opportunities that are available to support families and students. That's definitely not guaranteed, but you have to strategically plan your application and I'm sure you'll be able to achieve that. All right. So I think uh, both Adiraj and Rohan uh, have kind of told you, you know, why America is the right place. But, but do I have to focus on picking on a country first or a university first? I think there is no right or a wrong answer to that. Um, I have parents and families that come to me and they have a long term goal hey, we need to go to a country and we want to make sure uh, we get the PR. We become the citizen of that country. Con country. So you really need to understand the immigration policies uh, for that particular country. And that's why countries like, say, Canada, Ireland, the UK as well now, Australia are quite famous. Uh, some people really do want to focus on the kind of college uh, they go to. So... You know, I know people who actually want to apply to, say, economics program at Bocconi, which is in uh, Milan, or I know people who want to study uh, economics at LSE. I know people who want to study business economics at Rotman School of Commerce in Toronto, or somebody who wants to study even computer science at Imperial College London or National University of Singapore. So there is no right or a wrong answer. It's about you have to identify what do you want first what works for you and your family, and then try to put in the universities within that framework. Question to both of you, Adiraj and Rohan. I have seen families and students thinking about, I'll apply to US, I'll apply to Canada, I'll apply to UK, I'll apply to Europe, I'll apply to Singapore. Is that the right approach? Uh, like applying to so many places or focusing on your you know, priority two choices. Okay, this is my one, and this is my backup plan. That's it. I don't want to, you know, spread my efforts all over. And especially you, Rohan, you studied an Indian curriculum. And, you know, a lot of Indian curriculum kids from your school and other Indian schools across the UAE, they also have an option to go back to the, their home country. And they, they want to appear for the medical entrance exams or engineering entrance exams, etc. And it does become very difficult. And then you're not giving your best anywhere. So, so what's your advice there? Uh... Yeah, definitely. Uh, so as Warren said, it all, there's a right answer, uh, but I definitely do not recommend like applying to multiple countries just because the application for the US, a common app or the coalition app is big in itself. And I believe the UK is big in itself and even uh, Canada. 
So in the process of applying to multiple countries, you're actually losing out on valuable time to actually refine your application to the colleges you actually want to go to, uh, refine those essays or refine those like activity lists. Or if I talk about myself, so I, so for me, both country and university went hand in hand. Like I was fixed on the US and I really wanted to come to Boston. Now, why Boston? Just because pursuing biomedical engineering and eventually medicine, Boston is like the hub for engineering and healthcare as a whole. And, but my backup was Canada. And I had to realize that applications in the US or like the selectivity rate is quite low in the US. And so there's always a good idea to have a backup country and schools in Canada as, are as equally as good. Uh, so for me, uh, now, now that I decided I want to come to US, to Boston, that's where I narrowed down my schools. Schools like BU, schools like Northeastern, uh, schools like MIT, Harvard for that matter. But I also had a criteria in mind, scholarship and financial aid. Now I cannot emphasize enough the importance of actually having a conversation with your parents, your family, as hard as it sounds, as hard as, as hard as it, like it sounds like discussing finances with your family and knowing that if you can actually afford or not, but it's very important to ask your parents like, Hey, if I do go to the U S or Canada or the UK, will you be able to support me financially for minimum like four years? Obviously you can work on campus and earn money, but will you be able to support me? And that is a conversation you should definitely have before you decide which country. So yes, uh, if you want, you can go for the country first and then narrow down on the university. Or as Warren said, just pick the best college, which you think is the right fit for you and work on the country's application accordingly. Quickly, Adhiraj, tell us, like, did you, uh, I know that Rohan was very clear and he only applied to the US and I think he did send an application to University of Toronto as just one backup. Uh, what, what about you, Adhiraj? Like, what was your strategy, uh, you know, for 22 intake this year? So I think Varun, I would like to refer back to a conversation we had something sometime at the start of the admission cycle. And as you know, with business schools, really, you know, they're spread out all over the world. Uh, you know, you have Bocconi, you have INSEAD in Paris, uh, in France, then you also have schools in Canada and the US. Uh, I think picking a university or also picking maybe two countries, but making sure you give enough focus and individual attention to both is very important because, you know, if you sort of treat one as a safety option, it's a bit disingenuous to the whole process because I think each system, each application is individual, is unique. So I think in my case, I was very clear of, you know, the three or four universities in the US that I really wanted to apply to. And I think this is uh, something that Rohan touched upon, which is, you know, you should have a realistic but consolidated list of those three or four schools. And then also in Canada, which was my second option uh, to have maybe two or three uh, schools. So Western University, for example, and UBC, uh, and just make sure that I give my 100% to those schools and not try to you know, spread myself too thin uh, in the process. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, guys. So uh, just to wrap up uh, this slide, when you start your Excel sheet, first of all, you figure out what you want to study, what majors would suit you. Then you actually narrow down your choices of country and the, the universities and, you know, come up with that list. And at that time, you have to really, really take a call on, are you focusing on top school? Are you focusing on realistic schools? Are you keeping a few safe schools as well? And that's extremely important. And I remember uh, Rohin had a long list of colleges and actually he did make it to many, many other top schools, but he ended up going to BU. He did apply to schools like Columbia, Yale. He applied to the uh, Ivy of South Rice, which actually literally offered him uh, everything, including his food and accommodation, but he still declined. Uh, so uh, I think we'll get to know why uh, going forward. Uh, same goes with Adhiraj. I think he had a huge debate between whether to go to New York University or Northeastern, but he was sure that he wanted to go to a city, but also he needed a campus uh, that was, you know, more suitable uh, for his personality. So he chose Boston over Manhattan. So it is something which is very, very important. We should not just go by the name of the university. We should not just go by the ranking of the university. We really have to understand what they offer in terms of program, research, the social life, which is extremely important. And imagine if you're going to live maybe 10 years or 15 years, the rest of your life in the US, 
you're building your social life there. You're building your friend circle there. You're building your relationship with people who will be your friends when you're in your 30s and 40s. So the place really does matter a lot. Of course, career opportunities are indeed, uh, you know, very, very important part of that selection process and location. I know people who grew up in cities like Dubai, New Delhi, Singapore, London, Abu Dhabi. They just don't like going to certain kind of places uh, or you know, suburban campuses. So you really have to ask yourself, you want to enjoy your undergrad degree while accelerating your career growth. So guys, once that's ready, then you have to start planning when to apply to these colleges. All right, and what all you need to do. Well, there are a lot of tests that you need to take. And uh, uh, I was very, uh, you know, uh, uh, excited to call these two gentlemen today because uh, we'll find an interesting combination here. We have someone like Rohan who ended up taking exams like the SAT and, you know, did exceptionally well. He is an Indian curriculum. He was an Indian curriculum and, you know, he had excellent grades there, but he did not take uh, the AP's advanced placement tests of um, the U.S. Whereas if you see Adiraj, who is actually an IB student, he was pursuing his IB diploma and he also took AP's advanced placements but he did not actually take the SAT and he did not use his SAT scores to apply to colleges and still made it to the college that he really wanted to go to. So you need to really identify which test is right for you and which is not. So I'm going to start with Rohan. These days, I remember in your time, um, SAT subject test was there. So you were able to show your um, knowledge of certain subjects through subject tests, but it doesn't uh, exist anymore. So kids end up taking APs. How was your preparation of SAT? You know, what tips you'd like to give to students? Uh, so yeah, when I prepare for the SAT and everyone says like after 11th grade or doing 11th grade is literally the best time to prepare for subject tests or like uh, tests so that you can focus on your application. So I attempted my SAT twice in 2019 before the pandemic. So along with juggling with like the school exams, I really gave my press, I actually prioritized SAT over my school exams for a certain period of time just because I knew that, obviously, I didn't know the pandemic would happen. I didn't know it'd be test optional. So I was under the impression that the SAT schools will be like, if it allowed me to apply to the top university and top scholarship programs. So I just kept on doing practice tests. Like every Saturday, like I would pick out eight to 12 and I'll write a proper four hour practice test without any distractions. And then I would analyze my mistakes. And over the week, along with handling my school tests and assignments, I would review my mistakes and just keep learning and take a note of what I was doing wrong. As Warren said, like during my time, there was SD subject us. And that helped me just because being in an Indian curriculum, we don't have access to APs. So I could give that extra layer of academic qualification to tell colleges that despite not having APs, I really did try my best to like uh, challenge myself. Uh, so at the time I gave math and physics, but I would really, really recommend that if your school doesn't offer APs and being one year into college, like being firsthand into like BU, APs help just because obviously during admission cycles, they tell the admissions officers that you are capable of pursuing that subject. But when you enter the college, literally with an AP credit, you can skip the class like wholly. You don't need to uh, attempt the class again in college and you'll have extra space in your schedule to do classes which are your passions and which you want to actually pursue as something which interests you. So definitely get in touch with a counselor, ask him or her if APs are possible, but if not, I'll definitely try other schools if they accept external candidates and give a shot at APs. Now that subject tests are no longer in play in, in the application season. Well, thanks for that, Rohan. So guys, um, you know, SAT is considered like, uh, you know, a lot of kids are scared of SAT and they think that, oh, I can't get my 1500, 1550. But that's not the case. I think it's a test uh, that requires uh, discipline. It requires an ability to take decisions in a short period of time. And it's a standardized test. It's predictable. So it's all about how much you practice, right? But it is okay if you have not taken the SAT and if you decide not to take the test. There are several universities that actually accept students based on their entire profile, based on their high school scores. And also, as Rohan mentioned, and uh, I'm going to ask Adiraj now, you, know, you can also show off your knowledge of different subjects uh, 
you know, by taking uh, advanced placements, which is, um, you know, called APs uh, in short. Uh, there are multiple APs available, you know, from calculus A, B, B, C to stats, to biochemistry, different papers for physics, uh, world history, American history, psychology, computer science, and different languages. So Adhiraj, were you worried that you were not sending your SAT scores and you might not get into university? How did you overcome that? And how did you finally take the decision that I'm going to apply to colleges without uh, SAT scores? So Varun, I think there's this almost this misconception that, you know, and a good SAT score is like make or break for, an, for a person's application. And to be honest, in my case, I did attempt the ACT twice, but every time I just didn't get the score I wanted. So I think... Uh, one of the blessings for me was that because of the pandemic, a lot of schools did go test optional. So I sort of used that extra time to sort of strengthen the already strong parts of my application, because I think maturity early on is realizing that the SAT is definitely an integral part of your application. But when you're applying to the US, there's so many other things that they're considering. So for example, I knew for a fact that being a full IB student, I would definitely get credit from my HL courses. So that's so those were classes I really wanted to work hard on. Then I also knew that that my uh, 10th grade AP computer science score, which was a five, would definitely help me in some aspects. Uh, and then I also sort of just focused on doing other tests like TOEFL and giving my 100% on those. So it was definitely daunting knowing that, you know, I'm sort of part of this group uh, from my school that applied to the same universities as other students with SAT scores or standardized testing scores. But I think uh, many people will realize this as they begin their journey that really, you know, it's sure it may be a missing component, but there are other things that will definitely, you know, overshadow or outweigh them for sure. Fantastic. So guys, um, SAT, I would say definitely take the test. If you can work towards it, get a good score. It really, really does strengthen your application. All right. Start preparing for the test. I would say at least two to three years in advance and take the test. It's valid for five years. So you can actually take the test and, you know, keep the scores. It really boosts your applications. And even when you're applying for summer schools, some of the applications actually like to see the SAT score. So that's fantastic. Just to let you know, this year, the next SAT test is in August, followed by October and December for international students. Next year onwards, SAT will become a computer-based test for international students. So uh, those who are applying for 2023 intake, 2024 intake, and even for 2025 intake, they can always you know, start preparing for the SAT from now on and take the test before the end of this year. It will be valid for the next five years. Well, APs usually happen in the month of May only. Uh, it's uh, academic subjects. I would recommend you to Google AP syllabus and then you will be able to see the first link there, which is uh, from College Board. And you'll be able to see the list of all the subjects which are actually offered. You can see the syllabus and see when you're ready to take the test. I mean, some of the students I know took APs, easier APs for them, say subjects like psychology and English in grade nine and 10. Some of them took computer science or com computer applications in grade 10. In 11 and 12, they end up taking uh, exams like calculus, physics, biochemistry, uh, macro microeconomics, and whatnot. AP is out of five points. And uh, of course, if you get four or five uh, on the AP, you also get college credits uh, in most of the universities in the US. ACT is out of 36 points. Uh, it's got reading, writing, math, and sciences. Well, definitely diagnostic tests are available for both SAT and ECT. Take the test and identify which test is more suitable for you. IELTS and TOEFL, these are the English language tests. Not everyone has to take those tests, but if English is not your first language, and if you're not in British or IB curriculum, universities might ask you to take IELTS and TOEFL. I would say student like Rohan, who went to Indian curriculum school, he had to take TOEFL uh, you know, to support his application. But uh, Adhiraj, did you take TOEFL or IELTS? So Varun, I took TOEFLs just to sort of re-strengthen or sort of to demonstrate to the university or the admissions officer that, yes, I can excel in English. So that was mainly just done to sort of complement the rest of my application. Fantastic. Guys, there's a Q&A section. Uh, please ask us any questions that you might have related to these standardized tests. In the next 15 minutes of today's webinar, we're going to actually now talk about uh, different types of deadlines, early decision, early action. We're going to talk about how to build your profile activities 
and essays very quickly, but we as a team would be more than happy to answer your questions within the next 15 minutes. So please do leave your questions in the Q&A section or the chat box. Well, building your profile is a big deal, all right? But before we get on to that, I wanna go back and actually talk about the, uh, the early decision, early action application process, all right? Now, Adhiraj, how did you decide that you wanted to do early decision application too? So, Varun, I think when you sort of listening and hearing about the previous admission cycle and how, you know, a lot of students were left with disappointment at the end of it, they didn't really get, even in the schools that they sort of considered safety schools, uh, I was pretty clear that I wanted to do early decision. Uh, so I did have a better shot at getting in a university I would be happy to go to. So that's when I sort of narrowed down a list of 12 colleges to three. And I think that's when we had that conversation as well about, you know, which one ultimately is the right fit and also which one realistically with all things considered, uh, you know, would sort of guarantee for the lack of a better word, but definitely uh, make sure that we have a good shot of getting in. So I would say it's based on everything I've heard and also uh, because I really wanted Northeastern as well. Right. And how many early actions did you do, Rohan? Do you remember that? Yeah, I, I did two uh, early actions. I didn't do ED. Uh, I did one RVA and one um, EA, early action. Excellent. So guys, just to introduce you to these deadlines, let's look at the second one first, ED, early decision. It's a binding admission, which means you have to apply, let's say around 1st of November. That's when the deadline is for most of the ED colleges. If you get into that school, it's binding. You have to go there. You cannot decline that offer. So you need to be really, really sure that you're willing to commit to that school. It does slightly increase your chances because you're showing your commitment, but it doesn't mean if you're not suitable for that school, you will still get in. So you have to be the right fit. The school has to be the right fit. And then only you make it to that school. And that's the decision Adhiraj took. He thought Northeastern was the right school for him keeping the program in mind, the business school ranking, the co-op program, the city, everything really just was right for him. And I know he was quite confused between New York University Stern School of Business and Northeastern when he was trying to figure out which you need to apply to. But there were a few points, brownie points, which I guess Northeastern got, and he decided to apply and he made it. And that's why he's going there. Early action. Early action means that you're deadline is around 1st of November, depending on the schools that you're applying to. It could be 15th October as well for some of the schools. You get your decision early by December or early January, but it's a non-binding admission, which means you don't have to necessarily go to that school. So for instance, if you're doing Northeastern early decision, you can still apply in early action to other schools like U Chicago or Georgia Tech or UIUC or Michigan Ann Arbor and whatnot. Third one, restricted early action. What does it mean? If you're doing restrictive early action to a particular university, such as Stanford, you cannot apply early action anywhere else, all right? Anywhere else, that is a private school, but you can still apply to public early action schools, such as Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Regular decision is regular. So usually the regular decision deadlines are um, uh, around uh, the 1st of January, for schools like UCs, University of California, your deadline is 30th of November. For UTs, University of Texas, the deadline is around 30th November to 1st of December. For University of Washington, Seattle is around 30th November to 1st of December. So if you're applying for 2023 intake, it's a high time that you start working on your entire profile. And I understand that uh, both uh, Adhiraj and Rohan actually did exceptionally well. Their applications looked beautiful when they wrote down all those activities. I'd like you to pick maybe three of your most uh, interesting activities, Adhiraj, and share them with uh, you know, uh, our audience today and tell us how they actually helped you in your application. And did you actually choose those activities because you wanted to go to college or you actually did them because you really enjoyed doing them? So Varun, a lot of the activities that I sort of took part in were actually sort of referred uh, my way through the service uh, coordinator and the service program at my school. And, you know, I've been involved in about seven clubs. I've held about leadership or founding positions in seven or so clubs. But if I had to pick three activities that mean a lot to me, I would say the first one was 
the opportunity to partner with a nonprofit organization to tutor Syrian refugees. I would say that was probably a very rewarding experience, apart from allowing me to share my skills and to tutor someone and sort of mentor them for about 18 or so months. The second one is uh, an investment society at my school. And the reason for that is I think not only does it demonstrate to the university that I'm sort of thinking forward, thinking about my career post high school, but I also sort of uh, understood and recognized the need to promote financial literacy. And I think that was definitely a hot topic during COVID because that's when a lot of people were talking about stocks and finance. So I noticed that need. And I think the third project that I was very passionate about is this club that I started at my school. So again, sensing an opportunity with COVID, I realized that the world is going to soon transition to screens for the foreseeable future. So that's when I started my school's first ever online editorial, which sort of acted as like this bridge or a communication bridge between the students, faculty, and also uh, members of the public uh, and also parents. So they could all share their experiences and sort of uh, still create a feeling of community, even though we were all in lockdown and behind our screens at home. So I would say these three were three sort of activities that uh, I really was passionate about. Fantastic. And Adiraj, I think uh, uh, they really did add a lot of value to your application because it definitely showed that you had an ability to take an initiative, you know, through your, you know, finance stock market project. And it was not just about your interest. You took an initiative and actually took it to another level with a club, etc. cetera. Uh, your activities did show that you do have high level of empathy and you wanted to really contribute uh, to the society, etc. And your academics were very strong. So students, uh, universities do not only look at how good you are in your studies. They also look at with this fantastic brain, which all of you have, what else you can do? How do you contribute to people? How do you work in teams? How do you lead teams? So uh, Rohan, do you remember, uh, or, or do you want me to remind you all your activities that probably I remember? Uh, I, I, I don't know how many hours you worked on them. Uh, yeah. So uh, as Adhirat said, like, for me, uh, activities were not just for college. Like I didn't do them because of the college. Most of the activities that I listed down eventually were something I pursued since middle school. And those have been my passions ever since. Uh, my most important and the most meaningful to me has been public speaking, just because through that, just starting grade five through a Toastmasters public speaking club, I've been able to give motivation workshops to schools in India, like the government schools and both the private schools, along with that debate and going for different projects across UAE, India, public speaking has been something which has given me confidence to speak in public and just like express myself better. Uh, the next one I remember would be the student government of my school. I was very invested into the student government. In grade 11, I was the assistant head boy and grade 12, I was a head boy of my school. And the reason why I listed down um, student government as a second position was because going into the pandemic, obviously a new new environment for everyone, online learning. So being the head boy of the school and our school was like a 5,000 student school, uh, I was in direct communication with the senior leadership team and along with the head girl and I, we would have to plan events and we would have to like initiate everything from scratch. And that's what I felt to be very meaningful. And that's why I listed it down. The third thing would be karate. So karate again, pursued it since when I was in grade three. And throughout my time doing karate, I achieved a secondary black belt. But along with that, I've been able to compete nationally in the UAE and win positions in these tournaments. But along with winning positions, it really helped me focus on myself in terms of presence of mind, peace, and being in school in general is stressful. So when you go for a karate session, it'd be a great time to release that stress. And along with having achievements in that, I really wrote down what and how it impacts me as a person. Fantastic. So your activities, your profile should show consistency. It should show who are you as a person. All of us are awesome in our own way. You need to show in which way you are awesome. What actually excites you? What motivates you? Is it karate? Is it stock market? Is it actually art, drama, leading a team, contributing to a team, teaching somebody? cooking, painting, dancing, anything. Even if you like to climb or even if you like to uh, help somebody at home, just you can 
bring out an activity out of everything and anything that you like. You just have to showcase your interest beautifully to the college and then explain your story through your essays to them. And I think and that's a very, very, very important part of your application. And you know, when you're applying to colleges, now let's go back to the Excel sheet. You know which program, which country, which university, you've got the deadlines in place, and then you have your standardized tests, SAT, ACT, or APs, or TOEFL, or IELTS, and then your school academics are extremely important, which we have spoken about, and then comes the essays uh, and activities. So Common Application has multiple essays that you use to apply uh, to multiple or hundreds of colleges in America. UCs is University of California application, where actually you have eight essays out of which you need to choose four. And then within common application or coalition application, you have supplement essays of each university. So we're going to show you some samples today and talk to these two boys who wrote beautiful essays when they were applying to colleges. So common application has about seven, eight essays, and you need to pick one out of which, say, reflect on a time when you questioned or challenged belief or talk about yourself or anything. I think Rohin did mention that he is uh, five times Guinea's Book of World Record holder in Minecraft gaming. And I remember his common app essay was all about relating his life to that game, Minecraft, and how it contributed to his life. Um, uh, so, so how did you, you know, write that essay, uh, uh, Rohin? Oh, as Barnes said, if there was one thing which would like, stand out amongst our admissions officers it has to be the essays why because it gives them a window of who you are as a person besides the grades and activities now for me looking back like one year has passed since that essay and i can confidently say that that's been an essay which i'm really proud and really grateful for that we've been able to write it together along with brighter Pro. as Warren said like minecraft i've been playing it since grade seven and um achieving guinness world records in the game is definitely a very proud moment for me but more than that i i used to play it when my sister would go to college and i would have free time i used to play when i come back from school and literally just de-stress myself so when actually deciding between what topic i want to write about for the common app essay the most important essay i could have written about volunteering i could have written about my leadership leadership positions or the club which i started but after discussing with warren and the bright prep team we decided to make it a bit more personalized, a bit more non-conventional and relate my life, uh, both pre-pandemic and during the pandemic with Minecraft, with the journey of just starting from nothing and eventually going forward with like collecting all the resources in terms of clubs and experiences and maintaining your, in Minecraft it's called inventory, like all the resources you gathered. So maintaining your skills and actually implementing them to achieve the end of the game, which is happiness in life. So that's how we related it. Yeah. It was like 650 was like, it was on the dot 650 um, and definitely an essay, which I'm really proud of. So, so you see Rohin's uh, situation was that he's a verbose. He likes to use a lot of words to explain things. So his essays and inputs were like very, very long. It was very difficult for him to bring it down, but um, and, and Minecraft was very visible in his application and his activities and his achievements. And it was a little bit of a, a you know, risk to talk about the same thing again, but it was an important part of his life. And it really did matter a lot to him as a child to teenager and even till today. So it was important for him to talk about. So again, there is no great essay which a university wants to read. They want to know you as a person. It could be personal, it could be about your failure, it could be about your insecurities, it could be about an achievement, it could be about something small, which really does make you happy. And that's how Adhiraja's essay was. I think he went through a few iterations and I was just looking at some of the uh, you know, previous drafts that you had done uh, you know, a year and a half ago, Adhiraj. I think you went from one idea to another, from elevators to uh, somewhere else. Share your story of exploring that idea, which really did matter to you, and you uh, managed to come up with that awesome essay finally. So I, I think there really isn't like, you know, a set template to write a good essay with. I think if there's one thing that's consistent in all the essays I read, and also sort of um, looking back at my essays, I think it's authenticity. You really have to sort of own your story. So. You know, similar to Rohin, uh, something that I spoke about was my fitness journey. 
and how that was a catalyst for personal development. And um, I think something important to mention here was, although this was a very sort of personal topic for me, I think uh, one thing that everyone should be mindful about is that it shouldn't be too niche. And that's something that I try to be uh, extremely careful about to make sure that my story just doesn't make sense to me but the person reading it can relate to it in some way, shape or form. So that definitely was uh, a consideration that I had throughout the process. And I think the second thing that I would sort of recommend to everyone listening is, uh, you know, there's a 650 word limit, but I can tell you that for many universities, for the essays that I did write, even though there was maybe a 650, 700 word limit in my first draft, I would just go 1200, you know, it's like, just let the ideas flow, sort of put down everything because you know, when you're writing essays, there's sort of these moments where you're sort of in a state of flow. And I think that's very important because once you get everything down, you know, you can always have a different pair of eyes, look at it and sort of cut it down or edit it. Uh, and that's where Bridal Prep definitely came and helped. But I think the most important thing is be authentic, be yourself. And also remember that your grades, your stats can say one thing, can tell you, can say one story, but this is sort of your way of connecting to the admissions officer and, you know, really proving to them why you are the best candidate or why, you know, you're a great fit for that university. I totally love you, Adiraj, for saying that, you know, I think he used the word being authentic is just so important in your application and in these essays. And, you know, I, I think these are confidential documents, so I can't show you, but if you read both their essays without meeting them, you will actually understand the kind of person, the kind of people they are basically. So definitely just make sure that you really do put down what matters the most to you, who you are as a person. And I think writing that essay is also about showing what kind of decision-making style you have, which story of your life, which event of your life, which activity of your life, which characteristic of your personality or which anecdotes from your life or which analogies that actually you're using from the books that you have read or the movies that you have watched really does show what kind of personality you have and what matters to you. So essays are very important. Well, we are running short of time. So in the next couple of minutes, I do wanted to kind of talk a little bit about that some of the universities for their scholarships have separate essays. So please do make sure you start writing those essays early spend at least six months time in preparing your common app essay to your supplement essays, to your personal statements, to your you know, scholarship or financial aid essays. There's a lot of work that goes into it. It's not about writing the entire essay in one go. It's about putting down your ideas first and then you know, start building on. Don't think that you know, you're gonna just come up with an awesome 650 word essay in one go. It's about just putting your ideas down and down and down and then Make sure others read. Adiraj also pointed out another thing that make sure someone who's reading the essay understands what you're saying. And that is why taking feedback on your essays is very, very important from the people who know you and sometimes who don't know you, you know, because they can actually give you very objective uh, or and constructive feedback that can help you uh, improve your essays. Well, I think this was uh, one of the most important essays uh, for Rohin, especially because uh, uh, and I remember, I think uh, it was done just a few hours before the deadline, uh, which was 1st of December for this particular scholarship. And that brings me to another point, guys, there are different deadlines for different types of scholarships. So please do keep that in mind as well. That BU early decision deadline is, for example, 1st of November. The regular decision is around first week of January, but their trustee scholarship deadline is 1st of December. So you have to submit your application uh, in advance. And uh, uh, this essay was another journey. Uh, I, I guess, uh, uh, please do reach out to Rohin to hear uh, more about that. Moving on, uh, another important aspect of your application would be letter of recommendations or recommendation letters written by your teachers. They know you, but they are busy. You have to make sure you come up with your brag sheet, your CV, send all the details to them in advance. And I would say if you're applying for 23 intakes, send those details now. Make sure you give enough time to your school counselor or your math teacher or science teacher or economics, English or psychology teacher, teacher to come up with an effective recommendation letter for you. Most of the universities ask for a council recommendation plus two more subject recommendation letters. You can also take recommendation letters from people that you have actually interned with or your coaches or you know uh, anybody that can actually contribute to your application. 
Some of the universities also have interviews. I think Rohan, you had a few interviews for your scholarships. Uh, so those are important part of your applications too. You're interviewed by either the admissions committee member or by the alumni of that university who will talk to you about you and your application. So do prepare for that. And again, as I said, if you want scholarships and financial aid, there's a huge different difference. Scholarships are merit-based for which you might have to write additional essays as well. Financial aid is separate for which your parents will have to fill up something called the CSS profile, which is not offered by all the universities, but it is offered by many. So in CSS profile, your parents, your sponsor has to provide all the information of their earnings and expenses, and then ask for a certain financial aid. All right, all these things are important. It takes time, but if you plan that roadmap properly, you will be able to reach your dream university. So before we take questions from you, I'm going to take you to the funnel that we started with in the beginning. Make sure you identify the program, which universities you want to apply to, come up with deadlines, early action, early decision, regular decision, figure out, do you want to do early decision and commit to one university? If you want to, that's fantastic. All right. If you don't want to, it's okay. Apply to other universities and regular decision. Start preparing for the tests. If you haven't uh, in advance, take those tests. Uh, Focus on building your profile, picking all the activities that you have been participating in and how actually you can strengthen those activities. Again, Adhiraj did mention that instead of doing other things, he started strengthening what he had already, which actually did help him in his application. Essays do take a lot of time, so please start working on them from now on and submit the application well in advance. All right, let's take a few questions. So, uh, sorry, before we start that, any final tips, um, Adhiraj and Rohan? you guys would like to give to our, uh, your fellow uh, juniors? So Varun, if I could just chime in here, I think, yeah. you know, I think everyone's heard of the different components. And if I had to sort of use an analogy to summarize everything, I would say that all of these components are almost like pieces of evidence on a crime board. They're sort of different components, <laughs> different things that highlight and sort of demonstrate to someone who doesn't know you, you know, who you are and how you've been. And I think at the end of it, you should also keep in mind, you know, how you're going to tie things together. Because at the end of it, if you can sort of connect the dots together, I think that's like a very impactful way of, you know, submitting an application that exhibits a lot of confidence, but also an application that makes sense. Because oftentimes we can sort of get distracted. We can be sort of all over the place. But if someone in a limited amount of time who has, you know, maybe 20 minutes, an hour to evaluate you, if they are able to see that connection a lot faster, I think that would definitely help you and improve your chances. Totally agree with you. And I love that analogy. And I think somebody can easily steal that, you know, for one of their essays. Um, I think beautifully said, Adhiraj, it's all about making sure that your application makes sense. And when you actually put that entire common app together and you download as PDF, you really need to see who am I? This is my school. This is my family. These are my tests. These are my academic honors. These are my activities, my essays, my recommendation letters, which of course you don't have access to and your supplement essays and additional information section. It's not about writing a lot. I know kids who got into really good schools with just six or seven activities. You don't have to fill in all 10 activities. It's about quality. It's about relevance. It's about consistency. It's about being authentic. So that's what you really have to uh, think about. Rohin, any final words from you? Again, love the analogy. And some to pick up from his thing is connect the dots. Uh, obviously, when you put different people, you have to try to make it possible. You also want to put your yourself in the best manner when it is do things which excite you do things which you're passionate about when writing your essay be authentic and just have time as one stress like be please start early because some of your best ideas maybe even come like when you're writing when you're in the process of writing an essay and then you literally scrap that and start another essay that happens and that happened to me multiple times uh, so please start early that in doing the application season it's very natural to feel discouraged demotivated and then you'll ask yourself is it all worth it but i can confidently say after completing one year of college here in the u.s here at a person like boston university is all worth it 
come to the US and this one year has been one of the best years of my life. And when you do finish that application, sending the last application, hitting the submit button and fast forwarding to one year later, you'll thank yourself for putting that hard work for starting early. And then you'll just look forward to a great life. So I wish you all the best of luck. You're all amazing in your own respects, in your own ways, and you'll all do great. And I can't wait to see how like high you fly and how far you go in this journey called life. Well, this is amazing. And I must tell you guys um, that it's so awesome for me to see uh, students like Rohan, you know, when they come back and I look forward to talking to Adiraj after a year as well and see how he changes. He's anyways fantastic, but I'm sure he's going to become fantastic plus plus. So, um, well, good luck to both of you. I'm, I hope you both get to catch up in Boston and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Rohan, you, you have to take care of Adiraj. Well, let's take a couple of questions before we wrap up this session. There is a question related to SAT that I have 1200. Is it enough to get into a top university? But my GPA is really good. It's about 3.98. And uh, I have AP credits. I have some academic honors as well. So uh, according to me, uh, uh, Muhammad uh, Hassan Karim, uh, you should, um, it really depends on the universities that you're applying to. If the academic profile, your extracurricular profile, everything is fantastic, and that college uh, does not really require the SAT or if the SAT is optional, and uh, the, if their average SAT requirement is above 1350 or 1450, then I would recommend you not to submit your score or retake the score before you submit it. Uh, so. It, it's a very, uh, very uh, situational, subjective, peculiar decision. So I'll have to discuss more about uh, the college list that you're considering. Uh, well, yes, there are a lot of free, um, you know, SAT, ACT practice uh, tests and study material available. You can actually log on to Khan Academy as well. And even ACT website has a lot of practice tests that actually you can look at. Yes, this webinar will be available on our website, uh, which is bridalprep.net within the next 24 hours so yes you can watch the um, recording later uh, there is a question how is studying in the u.s like and how can i permanently stay there <laughs> in the future well i guess rohan has been all gaga about boston so i think uh, that's amazing uh, uh, studying is of course flexible uh, Talking about permanently staying in America, well, that's a question mark. Of course, after you graduate, you at least get a one year if you're a non-STEM student. If you're a STEM student, you get about uh, three years to stay. And then if you find a job and if your company sponsors you, sponsors you, you can get H-1B visa. You can apply for master's MBA and so on and so forth. How much would the CBSC board examination scores affect our application to a university in the USA? Well, actually, Academics are important overall. Your ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th, whether you're, you've done GCSE followed by A-levels, you've done MYP followed by IB diploma, or if you're from Indian curriculum, French curriculum, any curriculum, you have to show that you are disciplined. You have to show that you work towards getting better. It's not just about getting high grades. It's about showing progress. It's about showing growth. So from if you haven't done well in ninth or 10th, and if you have improved in 11th and 12th, great. Good grades are important. There is no set grades that actually a university would require. What would you say is the best college to get degrees like English and history to then use uh, in law school? Well, I would say there are a lot of universities you can actually consider going to liberal arts colleges um, and all the top universities such as U Chicago, Northwestern, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Berkeley, to all the other you know, universities such as Maryland, College Park, Georgetown, they all have College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. So guys, a university has College of Business, Engineering, College of Liberal Arts uh, and Sciences. So you can actually apply to College of Liberal Arts and Sciences to any university, or you can actually go to a liberal arts and uh, college as well, such as I mentioned in the beginning as well, Amherst, Williams, CMC, and whatnot. Uh, Angel, I'd uh, recommend you to write to us. Here is the email ID, info at brighter-prep.com, and we would be able to guide you personally. Once again, um, Rohin, Bajaj, thank you so much for joining us. It was really, really nice catching up. Many congratulations once again. I'm very happy that you're doing well, and I look forward to seeing you in Boston uh, or UAE sometime soon. 
Adhiraj, thank you so much. Once again, many congratulations. You have a few more days uh, to go, I guess, before your IB results come out. And um, good luck. I know you're a fantastic guy. You're going to do really well. And guys, thank you so much uh, for joining us today.